Flynn, Martha Mitchell, Jack Ruby, Lana Turner are just a few of the many clients our next guest has represented, practicing law for 50 years. World-renowned attorney Melvin Belli. I got I got two more years before 50. Two more? You didn't really, but I hit 75 the other day. Did you? God I had the biggest you. birthday party they've ever had since Emperor Norton in San Francisco, or since they built Alcatraz. I invited the whole city, oh. and 15,000 showed up. <laughs> And I think 15,000 people, 40 hams, 80 cheeses, and five <laughs> gallons of wine that we diluted. Good. And not you diluted not the wine. Bibli biblical diluting. <laughs> we had to dilute it. But we got another order coming in, so everybody had a lot. My friend, I've known you a long time. Yes, we have. You, you and I have friend. talked uh, on the air and off the air on many occasions. I want to do something with you because I believe in you. You're, you're a brilliant man. An honest man, too. I know that. An honest liar. I have never done this before in 21 years of doing a show like this. Wait I am going... Wait a second. I leave uh, my oh, wallet and everything <laughs> out here I'm going to do, do this. this. I had a, all, a whole thing planned I was going to talk to you about, but instead, you've been asked every conceivable question on television. What, Just about. What, what would you like, what would you, Melvin Bell, I like to talk about that you think these people should know about? Oh, I'd like to talk about... Um, the law, because um, it's good, it's better than it ever has been, and um, I've had almost 50 years in this wonderful profession and never worked a day. It's been fun all the time. Maybe that's why they call it practicing law, because I'm around now that I practice enough so that I'm ready to take on a few clients, and I hope the good Lord will give me about uh, 30 more years. I've got a uh, nine-year-older, Malia, who announced Nine, the other day that she's going child? to... Nine-year-old child? Yes, Malia, and she's son beautiful. Of a gun. Mm -hmm. She announced the other day she was going to Yale. I think she thinks Yale is the amusement park down at uh, Santa Cruz at the beach. <laughs> but Caesar is uh, 23, Cesare Belli, that's the way it should be pronounced. He's 23, and he comes out of uh, USF, and he joins the firm, and it'll be Belli, Belli, and Belli. Now, the other two, that's a sign on the building now, and the other two are not lawyers, so that violates all the ethics. Am I mispronouncing your name? You no, said I'm Belli. mispronouncing it uh, oh. anglicized, but uh, Why? I love someone to come in and say, Senor Belli, and then they start in the Italian, and I don't speak it. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it better today, law, I think than it's that, ever been? Uh, I think we're giving a better shake to uh, the, the minority economically, I don't mean minority racially, but I think everybody gets a better shake. Everybody can get a lawyer that uh, needs one. And I don't think we're out for the bucks as much as we used to be. You, so you're saying anybody can afford Melvin Belli? Well, if their case is serious enough, and the case is bad enough. Now, I've got two cases to go Monday. One of them we've been offered four and a half million dollars on. That's out of court settlement. Uh, yes, but we're not going to take it because I've got to get more than that because the boy needs more. <laughs> Paralyzed from here down, he can only move his head. Cost him two hundred thousand dollars a year to live. Two hundred thousand dollars just for his medical hospital and doctor. He's got a life expectancy of some forty years. You see. If we give him good care, he can live. If the jury comes back with less than something like $10 million, that's a death warrant because he go to the county hospital and he won't get this exquisite care. Now, I've got to try that case, but at the same time, I've got someone who hasn't given me a dime, and she's up uh, for killing her boyfriend on a homicide charge. That's the one that I'd like to try. But here I've got this other one, four and a half million dollars. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. Well, Are you busy Monday, would you like to? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me something. Well, how, did this, how was this boy injured? He was on a trampoline at uh, Stanford, and they had a Mickey Mouse uh, pit that he uh, jumped into, did a somersault, landed on his uh, head in the pit, and he broke uh, a second vertebrae, which is about as high as you can get, the atlas, and then the second cervical vertebrae. And he's paralyzed from here down. And he's got a phrenic nerve implant. That's a, 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 an electric device implanted in his abdomen right at the phrenic nerve, right above the diaphragm here. And he has to have batteries that stimulate that so he can breathe. If this fellow doesn't get those batteries ticking every second, he can't breathe. And then he may get some phlegm uh, in his throat so he can't breathe. So you have to have nurses around the clock. How old is he? He's 20 now. And he's a mm. handsome six mm. foot one. Oh. He's a computer scientist. And he's continuing to stand for it. And he's going to graduate. And he's going to be a computer scientist. Now, you have to ask the jury, do you feel, ladies and gentlemen, if you sit on this jury, 
that this man has a right to live or do, do, do you ever think that these horrible accidents like these, these catastrophic cases, do you think it might be better to pull the plug and let him go because you might get a, f a few jurors to No, say I that. don't understand. Why did you say I would much prefer to do the, the other trial first, the woman who is up well, for homicide? Well, I, I, I kind of like uh, criminal. I like uh, homicide. And, ah, and, uh, well, then you're, just, uh, you're, one of those you're thinking that, about Melvin Bell. Like then. Go on. Yeah, yeah, you really? think about... Well, when you've been practicing 50 years, every morning you get up, you don't know who's going to call you. We get calls from all over the world. We get 45 calls a day of new clients. Someone answers the phone for new clients. That's all he does in the office. We get calls. Switzerland today, Japan, back east. And they call us on everything from, from rape, robbery, uh, uh, everything that you can conceive. Criminal to wills, to personal injuries. And when you go down to the office, you don't know what's going to come in that day, who you're going to be talking with, what experts you're going to hire, what neurosurgeon, neurologist, what electrician to find out about electricity, suing the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. You don't know if you're going to be on trial here in San Francisco or Los Angeles, or at the end of the week, you're going to be on trial in, in Atlanta, Georgia. I had one the other day in Atlanta, Georgia, that I was supposed to try. It's another paraplegic, a boy that was injured in an automobile turnover, and I didn't go down, I couldn't go down, I got stuck on something else, and he wouldn't put the case over for me, and this I think the first time he ever tried a case, and he said, well, I can do it without Belli. He did, he got four million dollars, and Belli got zero on it. Oh. And I, just, I couldn't show. Now that's an economic thing. The, the economic considerations sometimes are paramount in a law office, but for an individual like myself, who's done every kind of a case and seen every kind of a case, seen every kind of a surgery, I have the choice now of any case that comes in. I like to take a will contest, I li like to take insanity cases, I like to take a homicide, and of course I like to try some of the paraplegic cases that involve a tremendous amount of medicine, new things, new things, mm -hmm. the implant and all the rest of those. A fascinating thing. Would you like to have handled the Hinckley case? Sure. I'd like to have handled... Would you uh, have gotten them off on the, on the insanity... Uh... They did a tremendously good job on that, so you couldn't have done a better job. And a guy comes up How with something like that... How do you feel like about that? that, though, a guy... I think that uh, I, I think justice was done because it proved the validity of an insanity defense because he comes back to court now and the judge said you were found uh, nuts so I'm going to put you back in the bug house. And I think words like bug house and nuts are as good as psychotic, schizophrenia, melancholy, depressive and all the rest of yeah. those things. I think the case uh, proved the validity of the plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. President Reagan and Ed Meese say, let's get rid of the plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. Mm. Well, gee, what are you going to do? You're going to say that people that are nuts and make wills or nuts and make contracts, are you going to enforce them? You can't do that. There are people who are insane that act perfectly normal, go out and shoot somebody and don't know what they're doing. And on people like that, I don't think that you can put those in uh, prison or execute them like they're going to do with this uh, girl up in uh, in Nevada that did a horrendous thing, killed six people, drove on the sidewalk on Thanksgiving Day, wanted to run the people down, did run them down, did kill them, and she'd been in ten mental institutions before this Thanksgiving Day. Everybody knew, could be prognosed by anybody that she was going to go out and do it again, and they let her out and she did go out and do it again. And then I think society was to blame for what she did. And then they, because we got to point the finger at somebody, Mike, they pointed it at her, and they gave her the death penalty up in uh, Reno. Mm. Now, how do I you... was wrong. Yeah. I've asked you this before, but it's been a, a long time since I've asked you this. Can you, can you take a case uh, when you don't believe in someone? Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, Wasn't it keep but ninety percent of the time, when you're through the case, you're, you believe in it. Really? Yeah, you, you convince yourself on it. Uh, you work so hard on it. But uh, if if you're going to make it subjective and get into your case, you're going to drive yourself nuts, or you're going to do a bad job uh, for your client. You've got to take the case as it comes, just like the the uh, uh, internal medicine man or someone comes with a venereal disease. You don't say where did you get it. You set about trying to cure it. And you can't look at, uh, at causation other than within the framework of evidence and in the law. We all feel that way. And we don't know if a man is guilty or not. Someone comes to me, if I were to ask him, uh, are you guilty? He, he should turn right around and go out the door because I'd be a very poor lawyer. He's not guilty until the jury says he's guilty because guilt is a mixed 
sociological uh, finding done by a microcosm of the community, the jury. <coughs> Is there a case that comes to mind that you're the proudest of? Yeah, of course, I think I told you this before. <laughs> the the uh, time that the Giants came to San Francisco and had the Cole Ballpark and they sued him for the price of a season <laughs> ticket. <laughs> and I collected $1,600 for the season ticket. That's why they called me flamboyant that and wearing this red lining. <laughs> but I, was, I was flamboyant on that. Mike, I'll never forget that one. We, we, sue, we sue Horace Stoneham for um, uh, $1,650 for the price of the season ticket. And uh, I had a lawyer from the office representing me. And he wasn't <laughs> jumping around enough, so I discharged him in front of the jury. said, out, you're, you're out, go back to the in office. In front, front of the jury? So the next, the judge said, well, we we'll take the afternoon off. So the next morning when I come back, this is a cold, it was a cold ballpark. Every <laughs> San Francisco <laughs> me about it was it. a cold <laughs> ballpark, too. When I come back the next morning, I'm dressed in muck luck, parka and a fur cap and I, I wore that during the rest of the trial and I called as my witnesses the Marines from the Arctic Survival Unit on the ice cap and they testified and they said they had red underwear on, electrical underwear and they were colder out in that damn ballpark than they were on the ice cap and they got a verdict for 1650 and that night the call bullet in the evening newspaper had a big streamer headline Bell I 1650, Giant Zero. That's the best I've ever got. Will you stay, Mel? We're going to bring on Stuart Granger in just a moment. Uh, <laughs>